What's up everybody, welcome to Found Flicks. On this ending explained, we will be looking at Unsane, the psychological thriller where a young woman is trapped in a psychiatric hospital. But does she belong there or not? Director Steven Soderbergh decided to shoot the movie in its entirety on an iPhone 7, which adds a quite cheap and unflattering look to the image, but the intelligent script and strong performances more than make up for its lack of production value. Our lead, Sawyer Valentini, what a name, has been the victim of a stalker David for some time, and things got severe enough for her to uproot her life completely and move far away to hopefully escape him. But even now, she continues to see the man wherever she goes. And so the question is, is she really seeing him now, or is she actually going insane out of fear of him returning? So let's check out Unsane, breaking down the story and the twists, what the truth is about Sawyer's mental state, and explaining the ending. We pick up with Sawyer at her new job. And even from our first time seeing her, it's clear that she is being watched from nearby. In our first scene with her at the office, we get a glimpse of the most important aspect to Sawyer's personality. Not only is she a hard worker, her boss calling her report fabulous, but she's an asshole, with walls around her to keep others at a safe distance. Then a man wearing a backpack nearby catches her attention, believing it to be her stalker David. And it's apparent that she believes she sees him everywhere, even if it has to be impossible. She's also quite good at spinning a yarn, telling people what they want to hear to get what she wants. Like lying to her mom on the phone about how great things are going for her, when the truth is, she's utterly alone and miserable. She tries to lead a normal life, even though it continues continuously proves impossible, going on a date with a guy she met on Tinder, offering him a no-strings night with her so long as he never contacts her ever again. But when she and her date go back to her place, she quickly breaks down, escaping to the bathroom and taking medication. She's obviously desperate for a human connection but is too worried about her stalker to follow through, and realizing how much it still truly is affecting her life even after the move, seeks out help from a therapist at the nearby Highland Creek Behavioral Facility. The meeting is relatively unassuming with Sawyer opening up about still seeing her stalker everywhere, and knows it's her imagination working to create her worst fears. But regardless, she still doesn't feel safe. Digging deeper, the therapist asks if she's considered taking her own life, and Sawyer admits to having occasional thoughts, but would never follow through. This is enough for her to professionally consider to having suicidal thoughts. With that, she asks to set up another appointment, and the therapist gives her some forms to fill out. But don't worry, it's all standard procedure. But after filling them out, it becomes clear that there are more nefarious intentions at play here, and she is soon escorted back into the hospital by a nurse, complaining that she needs to be back at work. But he avoids answering her and proceeds to collect her purse, immediately after another nurse enters, telling her to strip down to her underwear for a physical inspection. She refuses trying to leave, but finds the door is locked. She argues with the nurse that nothing is wrong with her, but the nurse isn't interested, telling her she better do what she asks. She relents, but even after the exam is not let go. As she is taken to a room where several other patients reside. She again pleads with her that this is a mistake, but the nurse lays it out bluntly that she signed the forms for voluntary confinement for 24 hours. Oh man, you always gotta read the fine print. She then changes her strategy with the nurse, suddenly appearing cooperative and appeasing her, asking to make a phone call to her family. She instead calls the police, telling them of her being falsely detained, triumphantly declaring she'll be out of here in 20 minutes. The nurse isn't impressed, asking her if she has any idea idea how many calls like that the police get every day. So it looks like she's stuck here and forced to make some new friends at the hospital in the meantime, like her neighbor Violet, who is a bit much, introducing herself by throwing a bloody tampon on Sawyer and telling her she's going to cut her hair off in her sleep. Sawyer replies there's no way they let someone like her near scissors, but Violet reveals a sharpened weapon she keeps hidden under her clothes. Ah, well that's not disturbing at all. There's also Nate, who knows how things run around here, laughing in response when Sawyer Sawyer says the cops will be here for her any minute. The local police do show up to check out the call as they are required to, but there is no evidence for them to be suspicious of, as they have the form signed by Sawyer volunteering for her stay. And based on all appearance, there is no reason for them to question things. The reality setting in, Sawyer can't take it anymore, banging on the door wanting to get out. The door opens to the bearded face of her stalker, whom she instinctively punches. Though it's not actually him, but another nurse who along with the others restrain and sedate her. That is not a good start to things for her here, and indeed it's starting to appear that she might actually belong in this place after all. The next day she speaks to a doctor, hopeful he will understand her situation. She desperately does her smooth talking thing, lying about the great support system she has outside, and that is the help she needs to actually get better. But he's unwavering, and after assaulting
assaulting the nurse, her stay has been extended to seven days. Understandably distraught, she later learns the shocking truth behind the hospital's intention with her from Nate. The reality is that the hospital and others like it are owned by businesses, and thusly are businesses themselves. And that means their intention is to make money. They find a way to keep people inside until somebody, for example, their insurance will pay. And when the money runs out, you're cured. In Sawyer's case, her time inside was extended to a week only because her insurance approved it. And the hospital is now earning money from her stay. When it's time for everyone's medication, one of the employees looks like her stalker, but his name tag reads George, not David. And again, she has been seeing him everywhere, even if possible or not. This further casting doubt on what her actual mental state is. She's still convinced though, getting increasingly upset and dragged away to her bed, now getting her arms and legs restrained. Well, that didn't help much at all. And again, her erratic behavior is making it appear to the hospital and us that she could very well be insane. Also, as she's warned, she is one infraction away from being tossed in the basement, which I don't know what that means, but it sure doesn't sound good. So she'd better start being a little more careful. Unable to sleep, she later catches Nate in his bed talking to someone on a phone, seeing this as a chance to communicate with someone to help her. But after this, Nate appears to actively avoid her, and she has another encounter with George. When a the patient loses it in the rear of the line, everyone is distracted, and George shows Sawyer a piece of mail with her mother's name and address on it. This sends her into another fit, screaming again about who he really is, but they have no reason to believe her, simply restraining her again, but at least avoiding the basement. She again catches Nate on the phone, and this time convinces him to let her use it to call her mom, and tells her about everything, including the stalker, something she apparently never told her about before, showing us how closed off emotionally Sawyer really is to everyone. Of course, her mom is horrified by the situation, heading to the hospital immediately. It doesn't do much good though. Arguing with the doctor, she didn't know what she was signing, but according to him, it's in her best interest to be here, and sends her to the head of administration who tries to convince her of the legitimacy of the organization, which is complete BS. The two are at least able to meet. Sawyer apologizing for not telling her mom about the stalker. All that she asked for is for her to stop building these walls, saying she's been doing this since her dad died. This appears to have had a huge impact emotionally on Sawyer. Even before the stalking, she had deep-seated issues. This causing her to create her cold, walled off, and well, overall assholish personality. Her mom leaves declaring she'll be back with a cavalry in a few hours, but finds even more dead ends. Well, so much for the cavalry. Though the movie up to now plays with the idea of George actually being her stalker, the next medication scene makes it crystal clear that it is in fact David with a stolen identity. Seen putting another pill of his own into Sawyer's dosage. She dutifully takes them unaware and soon after is totally tripping balls, going on a rampage around the room screaming about crayons and stuff <laughs> until the orderlies show up and put a stop to things. Now that the truth is out and we know Sawyer isn't nuts, the story shifts noticeably into more B-movie slasher territory, which isn't inherently bad, but the change is noticeable. It's starting to seem that David's plan all along is to help facilitate Sawyer appearing to be insane for his own purposes, and that is why he drugged her. To the staff, it was another enraged outburst, further proving that she is losing it. But now he's also got another problem to take care of, Sawyer's mom because she would take her away from him, while here in the hospital she is essentially trapped and under his control. So mom's gotta go. David's showing up at her hotel room dressed up as a maintenance man, talking his way into her room and then killing her. And it looks like his plan is starting to work. Sawyer, unaware of being drugged, is beginning to be convinced that she is in fact insane, leading Sawyer to open up about her past for the first time, filling us in on how things came to pass with her and David. It's while volunteering at a hospice care center that the two first met. One of her patients was David's ailing father, and by this point doesn't even recognize his own son. For many months she cared for him and read to him, and David was always there but never attempted to speak to or interact with his father in any way. He passed soon after, and at the funeral an upset David uses the situation to uncomfortably go to hold hands with Sawyer, who reluctantly allows him to, seeming mostly harmless. Unfortunately that is all it takes for things to get much worse. David clearly having unhealthy feelings for her, leaving her a note and flowers at work, followed by an 
absurd number of needy text messages, forcing Sawyer to block his number. He's not gonna give up that easily though, and takes things even a step further. Sawyer finding he broke into her house while she was in the shower, leaving a blue dress, his favorite, for her on the bed. Things getting more intense, she reaches out to the police for help. And guess who shows up but Matt Damon, for some reason, who analyzes every aspect of her apartment and her life, uprooting everything about herself in order to avoid David, handing over a super fun looking book to her entitled The Gift of Fear. Thanks, Matt Damon. Sounds like a great way to live your life. This shows us how things have been and how Sawyer's life has changed since David began stalking her, leading to her finally moving to get away. Though that didn't really work out too well since he found her once again. At least she's wise to him now and is able to avoid taking the meds he prepares for her. Worried about her mom, she tries to call using Nate's phone but never hears back. He assures her she's probably fine, promising she'll be waiting for her when she gets out. The two getting a little buddy-buddy, and the whole thing is witnessed by an extra jelly-looking David. Uh oh Nate, you're gonna learn the hard way to stay away from his lady. Nate gets attacked in the bathroom and tied to a wheelchair where David shocks him with a defibrillator, putting the paddles on each side of his head. Then later pumps him full of drugs, making it appear that he OD'd, which would fit the reason he was initially admitted to the hospital. Noticing Nate hasn't been seen all day, Violent confronts Sawyer about it, and she responds by angrily throwing coffee in her face, resulting in both getting taken to their beds, finding a phone there waiting for her, including a picture of Nate, freaking Sawyer out yet again, this time getting sedated by David, taking her to that dreaded basement, all darkened corridors that appear completely abandoned, Sawyer waking up alone in a gym mat lined room. David enters worrying her, asking if he is going to kill her, but he's hurt by this, saying that he loves her. He pleads with her that they can be happy together, offering her an off the grid cabin he owns in New Hampshire. No surprise he's got one of those, but Sawyer isn't interested. Since he's a psycho and a murderer and all that stuff, he further tries to assert that he really does know her, but she destroys the fantasy version of herself he has created. She continues berating him, David finally reaching a breaking point, crying and grabbing her by the neck, strangling her, her goading him to do it, but he can't, dropping her and continues crying, leaving the room utterly broken. After Nate's body is discovered, two orderlies clean out his locker, finding a notebook full of information about the hospital's dirty dealings, which they take straight to the administration lady, who stows it away safely in her desk. Phew, that was close. Almost got all their secrets found out. The next day, David tries a different, more friendly approach to Sawyer, bringing her her favorite breakfast, which of course he knows from stalking her, so it's already inherently uncomfortable. And just as before, Sawyer plays into what David wants. When David again promises that he really does know her, rattling off all of her favorite things, Sawyer concedes maybe he really does. But her actual intent here is to almost play into his fantasy, hoping it will in some way help her escape. And it's pretty clear clear from their conversation that he has never been romantically involved with anyone at all. She pretends that this is a concern, saying she needs him to be with someone else. She might be his last, but can't be his first. Despite his hesitation, he decides to follow through and abducts Violet at Sawyer's choosing, of course remembering that sharpened utensil she always has on her. Meanwhile, his whole plan is beginning to unravel elsewhere, as the body of the man whose identity he stole, George Shaw, is discovered by the police, a nurse who worked at the hospital leading them there. He then brings Violet into the room with Sawyer, who continues to hide her real intentions, urging David to have his way with Violet, who gets frantic pushing him off. So she tries herself, saying she knows Violet has feelings for her, as the two kiss, giving her a perfect opportunity to reach for that weapon she always has, stabbing David in the neck with it, slowing him down enough for her to grab his keys and escape. But Violet isn't so lucky, and David snaps her neck. Ooh, that's unfortunate. Also, it appears that Sawyer didn't really even try to help Violet at all, and just closed the door as soon as she got out. She's like, you on your own, bitch! As usual, a total a-hole. She frantically runs through the darkened basement corridors and luckily makes it outside, but rather than keep running, decides to hide nearby, giving David the chance to catch up with her and sneak attack her from behind, knocking her unconscious. She awakens to total darkness in the trunk of David's car, finding a plastic bag next to her. Inside, another body, her mom's who we didn't actually know for sure was dead until now. And Sawyer learns this by feeling the cross necklace she's always wearing. She grabs it, popping the trunk of the car open and hops out of the moving vehicle. And she doesn't have time to wait, starting to run as David comes to a stop soon after. Back at the hospital, the head nurse is awoken to a new story revealing Noah's true identity. As an undercover reporter, he was sent into the hospital to investigate their potential wrongdoings, but unfortunately perished without any proof coming out, at least for the moment. The officers are 
arrive at the hospital regarding George Shaw, instead finding the administrator already caught up in a flurry of media, denying any allegations against the hospital. And she might have gotten away with it until the cops discover Violet's body, leading them to return with an entire forest to search every inch of the premises. In the woods, Sawyer runs for her life and trips, David right behind her, knocking her unconscious again. He stands over her, and now that she's not talking anymore, he feels he's seeing the real her again, still continuing to believe that one day she will love him, even if it'll take a few years. At least he's willing to put in the hard work. He lies down next to her warmly, considering starting a family together, and Sawyer springs to life, stabbing David with her mom's necklace, blood spurting out from the wound. And while it for all intents appears that David is killed here, we instead leave them and conclude with the final cards falling at the hospital. Unsurprisingly, the police eventually find Nate's notebook detailing his time at Highland, along with the proof they need to take the hospital down, and the administrator is promptly arrested. All the secrets of their scam now exposed thanks to Nate, and Violet too, in a way. Our epilogue picks up six months after, and it for the most part initially appears that Sawyer came out okay, learning that she got a big promotion at work, seen eating lunch with her friend and being the lovable a-hole we know her to be, joking about firing her now that she's her boss. And it seems that things are finally over for her stalker problem, until she catches a glimpse of someone from behind resembling David, and grabs a knife heading towards the table. She brings up the knife, seeing flashes of him, but it's not actually David, it's just some other dude. She drops the knife running away, still on edge, checking over her shoulder. The point in the end being that even if David is dead, the impact he has had on her is permanently damaging, and she most likely will never feel safe again after her harrowing experience, as her worst fears basically came true, and she was just lucky to survive, even though what's left of her will always live with the fear in the back of her mind that David will reappear, even if it's possible or not, which is the exact same issue she was struggling with that led her to therapy in the first place. And it's honestly most likely even worse now. But chances are after being at Highland, she's not going to be interested in going the therapy route anytime soon, and will merely have to live in fear for the rest of her days, unable to really ever feel safe ever again. This brings us to the conclusion of this ending explained on Unsane. Make sure to always read the fine print, folks. What did you guys think about the movie and its ending? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.